one. How's it going, my fellow history scholars? Welcome back to the podcast where we talk about the unanswered questions of history and unravel the mystery and the many questions we ask about our past. I'm your host today, and our special guest is Gwen Stroth, who is the author of several poems, short stories, and essays, the director of the Artist Residency Program at the Dora Mar House, and has appeared in numerous noteworthy journals, including the New Republic, London, London Sunday Times, New England Review, and Kenyan Review. Thank you for joining us today, Gwen. Thank you very much for having me. I'm honored. Most recently, Gwen has published a new book titled The Nine, which follows the story of nine female resistance fighters and most notably her great aunt Helene, who led a band of these resistance fighters as they escaped a German forced labor camp during World War II. It's an amazing story. I'm halfway through it, guys. So definitely go check it out. But I want to first start by asking you, what made you interested in researching this book? And uh, did it have anything to do with the, the story, historical time frame, and how did the impact of your great aunt having a major role in the story play into researching the book? Well, the, the story really came to me because of my aunt. I didn't, I had no idea I was going to be writing a whole book or doing this kind of research or even that interest, that much interest in World War II until I started it. It was, that was a whole new discovery for me. So my aunt told me the story one day at lunch with my grandmother and the thing was, she had never talked about it before. Um, as far as I knew, she'd never told anyone or maybe just a few very, very close friends about what had happened to her. So it was kind of suddenly she's telling me the story about her being arrested by the Gestapo and being tortured. And then and this crazy story about this escape I, I, you know, I could, from Germany. I had never, I didn't even know she had been deported um, to Germany and been in Ravensbrück. So I asked if I could come back and record it officially. Um, and I did that a couple months later, and she and I did a recording that lasts about five hours. But I really didn't think I would write a book. I just thought I'll, you know, I wanted to record it and save it. And um, and then I went on with my life because that was in 2002. So it took a long time for me to um, get around to actually writing the book. And like I, I really actually thought when I started back on it in 2016 or 15. <laughs> that I would write an essay because I had written a few nonfiction essays that, that followed a journey and um, that would be sort of based in history. So I thought, well, this will just be one of those in the series of essays I had done. But when I started and went back and went to Germany and went to the camp where she was, it just became so much bigger. And I realized, first of all, I just realized I didn't know anything and I had to find out a lot more before I could write anything. And that's how it all started for me. It was really a discovery every step of the way. Yeah, that's amazing for sure. And I think there's only so much you can research and read and do stuff in the library before you actually go there and see this kind of stuff in person. So I, th I think that's such an important part to that story and being able to see where your great aunt had been and all of these women that were with her, it yeah. probably was such a profound experience for you, I'd have to imagine. Yeah, no, it really was. I, I mean, I live in Europe and I'm actually German, though I've never lived in Germany. Germany. I'm German because my grandfather was a German Jew who was made stateless by the Nazis. And, and I used the German citizenship to live in Europe and to work in Europe. But um, I had never really spent time in Germany. So that was one thing. And I had never been to a concentration camp. And I had also thought, like, I was sort of cynical about it. Like, I thought, oh, that dark tourism, people that do this kind of purient voyaging to places of suffering. So it was a credible lesson for me when I went there. The first time I went to Buchenwald, that was the first camp I ever went to. That changed my life. It was super um, transformative and uh, powerful. I went there with my daughter, who was the same age as Ellen had been when she was arrested by the Gestapo. Oh, wow. And it was, it was just an incredible day because it was freezing cold and we had really nice coming. I think we were speechless um, by the end of it. We just couldn't even. And then I realized I couldn't. Um, I couldn't write about something like this unless I really knew what I was talking about. So I, it made me really uh, change a lot of my opinions that I'd had. 
Well, I think you definitely have some authority, though, because you're related to the w one of the people who went through all of these major terrible things and all the stuff that went on in, the, in these in these camps. So yeah. it's amazing that you're able to have a almost yeah, no, not almost definitely a primary source of a yeah. person who is actually witnessing all of this stuff. So how mm -hmm. did this influence the way that you viewed your great aunt and what she went through? Yeah, I mean, it changed a, a lot because what I always knew, I mean, she was, I, unfortunately, she's dead now. And, and when I went to start writing the book, she was had already passed away, as mm -hmm. had all the women, which was really a regret I had. Because um, if I had started right after I interviewed her, I could have met many of them. They were still alive then. But by the time, in fact, by the time I figured out, it took me a while to figure out who the women were because she didn't know their names. I had, that was a lot of the detective work that I had to do was try to figure out who were the nine in this group. And by the time I figured out the last one, she had just died, I think nine months earlier. It was like this wow. wave retreating, you know, but, um, yeah. but, but it, it is, it's true that um, the primary source of my aunt, that was very, very important, that first interview. And then I was able to find other accounts written by these different women um, and uh, accounts that they had given to their families sometimes. So, you know, interviewing the other family members, that was really important as well. Like, and that I, when I was able to do that because they knew I was also a, a, dis, a descendant of one of the women. So that gave me a little bit of a, you know, they, they were more welcoming and open, I think to me, they were very open in, in, in any anyway. But I'm, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, and then I, what I was going to answer your question, my, my great aunt, um, Ellen was always very regal, very, very elegant, you know, really well dressed, but really quiet. Like um, everyone knew in the family, she was super smart. She was an engineer. She spoke many languages. Um, she was an expert, ma you know, mathematician. Mm -hmm. And she, she had a, a pretty high level jobs for a woman in her generation. But she was just really just, she was one of those people that just didn't talk. You know, she was very quiet. Um, and so then when she told me the story, um, I just, you know, she also, she was little, <laughs> you know, she's a little person. And so just suddenly, you know, she had the things she did, this, the kind of, and, and it turns out she was sort of the leader of this group, um, uh, which is what other women wrote that she was their leader. So I, that was astonishing. And near the end of her life, the French government recognized her and she got um, a Légion d'honneur officier, which is a very high rank. It's the highest honor, and she also got uh, the Medal de Résistance and the Medal de Déporté. You know, she got a series of military honors because mm -hmm. around the end of her life, they were starting to recognize women as important to the resistance. Yeah, and she from, she, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, it's all good. I don't want to interrupt you, but yeah, from what you wrote in the book, the fact that uh, all these women were doing these amazing things, helping the Allied troops, and getting these packages that they were dropping from the planes mm -hmm. they did play mm -hmm. a very crucial role and i feel like that's been so overlooked and so i'm glad you mentioned all this important mm -hmm. stuff that these women did in your book yeah there was a kind of um politics after the war partly because i think the french had been the french military had been humiliated by the quick defeat um and de gaulle and the men they were part of you know women in france didn't have the right to vote until near the end of the war so there was really this tradition of uh, women were not supposed to be seen as warriors or any way kind of um, doing this kind of work. So there was this idea at the end of the war, let's, you know, all of you with girls keep quiet. The men need to take the glory. They've been so badly humiliated. They even said that like, because the men have been humiliated, let them take the glory. You need to step back and go back to your former roles. And it really, and, and a lot of these women really kept quiet about it because there was also a sort of shame of having been deported. If a woman had been in the camps, often mm. marriages would be called off if that was discovered. It, it was considered, um, you know, it was kind of shameful. It was, it was a taboo subject. And um, and so, yeah, the, these, these stories were really um, silenced for a long time. The women didn't think that they should talk about it. They even silenced each other, I mean, if one woman talked about it, then maybe another would say, like, what do you do? You know, you shouldn't be talking about this. This was this is our secret kind of thing. But because women there, especially these young women, had a kind of flexibility, they could move around in a way that the men couldn't during the occupation. 
they did a lot in the resistance. Um, and there, I had in earlier drafts of the book, but thank God I had an editor. I had a lot more about the networks of women and some of the most astonishing female leaders of the resistance, along with the, the nine that are in my book. And you start to see this picture of uh, women who did a lot and then later um, were not at all recognized. Right. And I think that's why your book's so important, like I was saying, because of the politics of the war that you mentioned and the mm -hmm. fact that these women did play such an important role. But when you were researching the story, was there anything shocking that you learned about specifically your great aunt and the other people that were involved in this story? Yes. I mean, uh, there was uh, there were some things that were really difficult in the research of the book. Um, one of them uh, was the, the part about what happened to children that were born in um in the camps and how many children were born in the camps. Um, uh, that part was hard to write. It was hard to read about. There were, there was some parts of, uh, you know, torture and uh, cruelty that I left out <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't want to put in anything that wasn't necessary to understand the story. Like I didn't want to overdo it, you know? And, um, so that, that that I think that really shocked me at times. It shocked me to Ravensbrück because Ravensbrück is this gigantic. It's the second largest concentration camp after Auschwitz Birkenau, and it's a camp only for women. And um, it's it, almost every woman that was deported, if they weren't sent to Auschwitz and usually exterminated there, killed, murdered there, they would be sent to Ravensbrück. So almost all the women who were deported to Germany went, went through Ravensbrück. And later were sent to labor camps where they were working, uh, they were forced to work for the German army, but, and were made a lot of money for the, uh, for the SS and the, uh, yeah, for basically for the SS. Um, I was just shocked by like how big that camp was, how many women that went through and how little is known about that camp. Mm -hmm. we, we don't talk about Ravensbrück and it's sort of central to the whole story. Um, and, you know, and how, and basically the story of what happened to women and women's bodies and how they were treated during the war. If you don't know about Ravensbrück, you don't really know about, about the, about the war. Yeah. And I, I feel like we have a huge narrative on everything that was happening to the Jewish people at the time. And I feel like that it fell a little bit from the mainstream, but it was just as terrible what was happening mm -hmm. to all of these women and gypsies mm -hmm. and disabled people as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. And sex workers. Yeah. Well, actually, what yeah. was really shocking to me, yeah, there's, I'm remembering now as you bring these things up, you know, that, for example, uh, the Roma and Sinti, the gypsies, weren't recognized until 1982. Their genocide wasn't even recognized until 1982. Uh, Jews were never mentioned at Auschwitz until then as well, because it was behind the Soviet Union, behind the Iron Curtain. Right. And it was seen as the, as the, it was framed as this, the, the, the workers' struggle against the imperialist West. So even the, there's a big um, statue of, the, of this woman, Olga Benaria, um, carrying another woman. And she's sort of, she was a communist, so she's seen as this hero. But she was actually murdered because she was Jewish. But they didn't mention that. You know, that whole, the part of the Jewish genocide wasn't part of the story. So yeah, they're, they're, and so, you know, and sex workers were completely not uh, recognized. And were later a lot of them when they got returned to France after the deportation after their imprisonment when, during the liberation were then put on trial for having slept with, with German soldiers and were you know shaved their heads were shaved and they were humiliated so yeah. they were really not even you know even though they had gone through the same awful treatment and and some of them had actually also been working in resistance they were treated um, terribly and and they definitely shut up. And so in all the the war tri um, war trials afterwards, there's no one from those groups. There's no one from the homosexual lesbian group, no one from the, uh, the Sinti, the Roma, nobody from the sex workers. All of those groups do not really exist um, in, in the narrative until until now, really, until starting in the last couple of years. Yeah, and even a part that I didn't realize and I it came to, my thoughts because of your book actually was the fact that because of all the stuff that the red army was going on do or that the red army was doing and the impact of the iron curtain that had a huge impact as well on this narrative, not coming to the yeah. mainstream and people not being able to hear about this story. That's right. I mean, one of the, the things is that people don't know about Auschwitz is it was really framed that way. And the parts of Auschwitz that were saved are made into the memorial that you visit today. Um, mm -hmm. are, 
are that, and there's the, the, where the first and the most important, for example, uh, crematorium is, is outside the borders of the camp and for years was uh, just a private home, you know? So only until very recently, I think, has it been um, bought by some Jewish groups to, as a, as a site, but it's not a site that anyone visits because it's not really considered, it wasn't, you know, put in the, anyway, it's, it's really interesting how the, the narrative of these places changed over time as the history, as the understanding of history changed. Yeah, for sure. So how did you go about researching this book and were you able to interview any of the descendants of these women? So sadly, I didn't get to interview any more of the descendants, but um, yeah, you're what I did, that. What I did get to do, um, what, I, what happened kind of um, by luck is I stumbled upon other uh, narratives. I stumbled upon a book that was published a few years after I interviewed my aunt. Mm -hmm. And that happened to be the story that Zaza had written right afterwards, but it was never published. Because again, it was, it was just, nobody really wanted to hear from a woman who had been in the camps. And so um, she'd written the story and this little manuscript, it's, it's a slender book. It had passed around her family and then it was finally published in 2004. So I read that and I realized, I recognized the story. I thought this is so similar to the story that Elaine told me. It wasn't exact, but it was close, you know? And so then I, um, based on that, I took that to Elaine and asked her, is this, is this, and she said, she recognized, she said, yes, that's Zaza. That was my friend. Oh wow! And then I found an, yeah. So then I, I had more elements because in that book, she told more, um, she told more of the story. She told, she at least had the nicknames of the women. Um, she had the nicknames of the nine women, not their full names, but at least their nom de guerre. So that helped in my, um, you know, detective work. And then um, there was another book that was published by the Dutch woman, Non, but that got published later, more like in 2011, I think. And then some Dutch documentary filmmakers contacted Hélène trying to make a film. And they filmed Hélène and Non meeting after 65 years, and it was right before both of them died. That film is available on my website. It's really, I, I recommend it. It's got subtitles. It's a Dutch documentary, but it has English subtitles. So I had those things. I had those. And then I slowly, as I found the families and found their names, I, some of them actually had transcripts or letters or, or, or diaries by some of, the, of some of the descendants. So I was able to piece together, um, you know, about four or five different points of view of the story from the actual, you know, firsthand primary sources. But then, um, then I read a lot of books about the other, other women that were in the camps and then histories and lots of other resistance fighters and, you know, um, and I interviewed all the families. Um, and that was interesting because they often started by saying they didn't know anything that the women never talked about it. And then slowly they would say, well, actually there was this thing, you know, they would say these little really interesting details and then you, people actually knew more than they thought they did. But your great aunt Helene had an, that she didn't know about Zaza's book until you showed it to her. Mm -mm. No, that's what didn't. I found interesting. That's, that's crazy that these yeah. people knew each other during the story, but she had no idea that uh, Zaza yeah. published the book. She didn't, I think, yeah, she didn't know. And, um, and Zaza sent a copy, an early copy of her manuscript for the book, which was longer actually, and was covered more time because Zaza's book itself only covers the, the escape. And she sent that to Zinka. And um, when I contacted Zinka's daughter, um, she was inspired to go and look in her mother's her mother had died, but she went up into the attic and went through these boxes of papers. And in the box of papers, she found that manuscript, which was something that Zaza had sent to Zinka probably in the 1940s or 50s. And Zinka had made notes on it and probably sent it back to her. So I saw then some of the more, the stuff that she took out, the, you know, <laughs> from the actual published version, which was really interesting. Yes, that's Suzanne's book, Zaza's book, and it's coming out in German. Mm -hmm. um, soon uh and th there's a french version called neuf filles qui ne voulaient pas mourir uh, nine women who didn't want nine young girls who didn't want to die the fille jean qui ne voulait pas mourir. yeah do they have a english translation of it yet no 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 and there's no french translation of my book either which is <laughs> i live in <laughs> france i really wish i really yeah wish that's that's kind of ironic yeah 
but it's I really if, if you read German or French, I really recommend um, Zaza's book, and I also recommend the documentary, the, the Dutch documentary. It's beautiful. Okay. I have a listener here, uh, Cindy, my mom, actually, she's watching and she was <laughs> saying it was probably odd, oddly comforting to these families to have these strong women and their family recognized and their struggles brought to light. And I think your book had a huge part in, uh, in bringing that story to light. Yeah. I mean, I, I thank you um, for the comment. It's, tr it's true. And I'm really humbled by it, but um, I, I, I was very shy about contacting the families as I was doing the research because I thought, oh, you know, who am I, you know, whatever. And when I when I finally contacted them, they were almost all so welcoming and happy and interested and, and some of them didn't know very much and then I was able to show them things and tell them stuff and that was really cool. And then I've been able, I sent the book to all of them and I've gotten some lovely, lovely, um, responses back from them. And I also just recently had a book signing in Paris and a bunch of them showed up. So we were able to do a big picture with a bunch of the descendants and they met each other, you know, cause these are now like great grandchildren and nieces and nephews. Yeah. And, and it was really, it was really moving. Like, you know, we all got a little teary eyed. So it was, it was really, really great. Yeah. It's, it's powerful. Yeah, um, I would imagine I think, so. Mm -hmm. I, I think for me, one of the, um, really powerful points for me in the writing of the book or the research of the book was when I um, found Zinka. So Zinka is one of the nine, um, and I couldn't. I had a really hard time finding out who she was because she had a complicated situation where she married a man who had exactly her name, and then he, you know, I, I won't tell anybody what happened. Basically, it was hard to find her, and um, mm -hmm. and she had had a baby in in prison. She had a baby while she was in French prison. She'd been allowed to keep the baby for 18 days. Then the baby was taken away and she was deported to Germany. And that baby was called France, um, which was it's, yeah. it's a very common name here. And I thought if I could find France, that would be great because I thought France was still alive, you know. And um, that I had these series of really wild coincidences that allowed me to find France. It, I, sometimes this book was sort of miraculous that way. There was just these strange things, doors opened. Anyway, I found France, I, I contacted her. She doesn't live that far away from me. And I drove up to see her and she didn't, she, she had been reunited with her mother, but um, because her mother never talked about it and because her mother had tuberculosis, she, her mother had contracted tuberculosis in the camp. And her mother was very sick afterwards. Um, France really experienced abandonment by her mother that she just felt like her mother had abandoned her. And here she's a 70 year old woman and I was able to tell her um, how much her mother talked about her because in so many accounts, even ones that don't have to do with these nine, people who knew Zinka in the camps talk about her and talk about how much she talked about her baby France and how much she wanted to get home for her baby. And mm -hmm. they all knew about France. And, um, and I was able to send her these different accounts and these different things. So when I saw her, you know, she and I like hugged each other and she said, I said, you can't believe how, I said, I said, you can't believe how long I've been trying to find you. And she said, well, imagine for me after 70 years to learn all this about my mother. So it was like we, we passed an afternoon together, basically crying and talking. Um, and, um, and then she's the one then who went into her attic and found the, the larger manuscript and the other documents that really filled out the story. So from her, I realized that I was, um, that it was, you know, even though I was stirring up these sort of painful things, it was also helping her because she had carried this trauma of what she perceived as abandonment her whole life. And then she could sort of recognize that it was, it was a different story than that, that her mother had really wanted to be her mother, you know, wanted to be with her and had um, missed her. And, and also, and I'm talking also one of the things is that she um, in a way saved her mother's life because Zinka was arrested pregnant and, um, they would have deported her right away and probably she wouldn't have survived because people didn't survive that long in Ravensbrook. The longest, you know, you could survive a year maybe, but it, you know, I think the average for a woman was nine months in the camps, the life expectancy. So in France back then, they didn't deport a woman who was pregnant because the baby was considered innocent. And so they would wait for the baby to be born before they would deport the mother. And that nine months made it so that Zinka wasn't so long in the camp that she was able to survive, you know, it, it in a way saved her life. Um, so, you know, we talked about that too. So in some ways that was very 
moving for France as well to realize that, you know, her being born was really important as well to her mother surviving. Yeah, I find it crazy that she didn't even have an idea about the story mm -hmm. herself or such. She had no idea about the, 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 the she did, yeah, she didn't know about the escape or anything. She just knew that she was, she knew she'd been born in prison and that she'd been taken away from her mother and that her mother had, didn't, was in the resistance. And then that was it kind of, she didn't know anything else. Yeah, and your book's full of all of these profound stories, but I, from what it sounds mm -hmm. like, it, there was a ton of profound moments as well behind the scenes that yeah, it went into to researching the story. So how did the story impact the book and uh, your understanding of what these women went through? Yeah, I, it was really moving for me. And it's been, um, it's not, even though it's a dark story, um, it's also a story of survival and hope. And um, and as I did the, the research and, and met these families and learned about the trauma that went through generations and also some of the wonderful things, I, I, I was just, um, it was kind of a joyous uh, project in a weird sort of way. I, um, I learned about this, this courage and this kind of solidarity between the women that I, um, you know, was just, that was really powerful. But, you know, the, there's, there's the one side of the story, which is this kind of massive, cruel machine of the Holocaust and of the, the Nazi mm -hmm. killing machine, you know, this kind of grinding thing. And against that is this incredibly beautiful stories of kindness and generosity and real um, human courage. Um, and really amongst the women, they were, I think one of the reasons that women survived longer than men is they were really um, solidaire. Uh, I, I, they were really like, they really helped each other out. They saw that they saw that helping each other was a way to survive. And those stories about how they helped each other out at great, great risk to their lives was just amazing and moving to me. You know, again and again, I would read these little tidbits and I would just be like blown away like and wondering, would I be that nice and kind in that situation? You know, they had this thing called um, the gamelle de la solidarité, the, the, the bowl of solidarity. And they would pass it around at night when they had, they were starving, they were so hungry, they had hardly anything to eat. And everybody would put, who could, would put a spoonful of the soup in that bowl or a piece of bread in that bowl. And then they would give it to whoever that day needed it the most. So to me, that's amazing. You know, there was a quote by one of the women, not one of my nine, but another woman, um, uh, I think it's Juliette Bess, who says, um, charity is giving when you can give, giving what you can give. Solidarity is giving when you have nothing to give. And that was just like mm. super powerful to me that this, this idea, yeah. Yeah, so the oldest woman were 29, uh, Josie, what the youngest Jose. was 20, Zaza, Jose, yeah, was 20. Zaza and Zinka were the only two to have husband. Uh, six of them were French, two were Dutch, one was Spanish. So they came from all these different backgrounds and places in life. But how you described it, they were able to unite under this hardship and they were ultimately able to, to survive together. And like you said, it's this beautiful story of hope and uh, being able to persevere in the face of evil and suffering. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I was very moved by how they came from different um, socioeconomic backgrounds, different countries, different languages. Um, that was sort of an important part of the story that I think that um, they weren't all alike. And the ones that stayed friends were the ones you would least expect, like Gigi, who came from a very aristocratic Dutch family, became really close with Mena, who was the most working class of the group and stayed friends for life. And it was because of their friendship when I contacted Gigi's family, they were the ones who put me in touch with Mina's family. I wouldn't have been able to find her otherwise. Um, yeah, so I think that diversity was really uh, amazing uh, about them and, and how young they were. <laughs> they were so yeah. young. I mean, really. Like I'm 19, uh, so 20 is crazy. Yeah. Sorry to yeah, interrupt absolutely. you. No, 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 that's fine. Um, Nicole, who was really important in the resistance, she was arrested the day after she turned 22. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, it's crazy to me um, how how young they were. Maybe that helped them. I mean, I, I, they said it helped them because they were stronger physically. Um, the older women uh, also would be selected for extermination sooner. Um, mm -hmm. So it helped them survive the camp. But um, but the way that there was this kind of network of, sol of solidarity, all these different things that they did, they would celebrate Christmas, they made presents for each other, they, do, they recited the meals to each other, these things that they did to, to, um, 
to stay as a group were really powerful. Yeah. It's hopeful yeah. to me about, about humanity. <laughs> For yeah. sure. So what, what do you think helped keep them so resilient and with all these different things that they went through? Um, I've asked my aunt that I kind of asked her, you know, why yeah. weren't you scared? Like, why, how did you, and they were just really, they really believed um, in their cause. Like they, they knew that France would win. They just felt that the Germans were not going to win. Um, that this war was going to be, you know, that they were going to win this war. And they really saw themselves as soldiers. They really saw themselves in that fight and they believed in it. And they also, um, I think they were inspired by other women who had died. So, you know, there were some great women resistance people like Danielle Casanova, um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on some of the other names, but they had, that had led them earlier in the fight and they, they knew had died. And they, for them, that too was like, they had to continue because of her and um, the sacrifice of other women. So they um, they had that kind of soldier's mentality, that kind of patriotic, um, and also, as my aunt said, a loathing of fascism. Um, and, uh, and I think that they were young and I think the friendship held them, they helped each other. When one person was struggling, they, they carried them, you know, they, in a way, that tightness, that kind of friendship that they had, I get the feeling that they never experienced that again afterwards. Um, and that was one of the harder parts of um, coming back to normal life. I mean, they're, they're, they're coming, their return to normal life was difficult for all of them. Um, and especially because like PTSD wasn't recognized and especially because their, what they went through wasn't recognized. Um, and they, and one of the things that I think was hard was they'd had such a strong bond and such a sense of being like trusting each other and being so close that they would never feel that again. So do you think that the resilient spirit that they already had from helping fight in the resistance ultimately helped them in going through the labor camps as well? Yes, definitely. Definitely. And there was a, there was a good network of, of, uh, in, in the camps, um, uh, when they got there, by the time they got there later in the war, there was, had there been established a pretty good, you know, network of, uh, of other resistance fighters and other women, um, who helped each other and helped them, get through the camps and get through. Uh, and also that was near the end of the war that helped them a lot too. And I don't know if they could have survived if they'd had to survive a whole another year. Cause by the time they escaped, they were all pretty ragged. You know, there was several of them were suffering from serious illness, broken bones. Um, and they would go on to have those illnesses for the rest of their lives. Some of them, you know, they were permanently, um, uh, you know, hurt by what, what happened. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, that it, it helped them survive, but also it, the, 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 the cruelty of the German, of the SS also helped, you know, for, made them want to survive in a weird way. Yeah, to kind of get back. Yeah. These people on the side, so they were playing an active role in helping the Allied powers, and even when they were in the camps, they were trying to find way to the the fight against the SS and the Germans still, and to stay motivated against the all the mm -hmm. evil that was going on with the Axis powers. Yeah, absolutely. My aunt was in, um, she got very involved in sabotaging the armament factory, and um, was able to successfully sabotage um, a lot of the fabrication of these Panzerfaust, these shoulder held like sort of bazookas, the shells. Um, and she was really proud of that. I mean, when she, when I interviewed her, she said when she was able, because she was able to kind of rig the um, the forges so that the they would temper the steel poorly, and the, then the steel then those uh, shells would probably explode in the face explode upon in the face of the soldiers and kill the soldiers using them instead of you know the people they're aiming at. And um, and she knew it was working because they kept getting inspected because there was something going wrong. And the, but the people inspecting couldn't believe that the women were actually capable of any kind of real sabotage. So um, she was really proud of that. And when I interviewed her, she said that was when I knew that I was still a soldier and I was still I could still you know fight and I could they couldn't stop me. So that those acts of sabotage were really important in keeping the spirits alive. And, you know they also had help from Germans. I mean, it's just one of the things she pointed out to me was that the everyday Germans were really uh, hated the SS and were also oppressed by the SS and wanted the war to end and mm. didn't 
weren't happy about where the situation at all. So they found allies in all kinds of places. Yeah, I didn't had no idea that even the the common people, the Germans, were so against the SS and the Nazis, and that it just because of how sheer evil uh, these SS and Nazis were, that their own people were were mm -hmm. surely against them. I mean, if, if you read the um, the uh, the stories of Germany before the war, um, there's a few novels uh, that are great about this that show just how creepy it is. You have this SS police that starts to surveil everybody and everything and everyone's being watched and everybody has to tell on each other. And there's this kind of yeah. heightened paranoia and, um, and people really, you know, they couldn't, they felt they couldn't fight back. They couldn't stand up. They would, they, um, so they were kind of in this grinding machine without against their will. And I think once the Germans were just, well, Russia, once the Germans started to do badly in the war, People started to be able to like, wait a second, this is really we're we're really in the you know in a terrible situation, and they wanted out. And there were, as you know, there were attempts on Hitler's life. There was an almost a successful attempt mm -hmm. by his own high command. Um, so there was you know a dissent in the ranks. Definitely, people knew that this they were following a crazy man over a cliff, you know, and and they needed. Uh, but it took a while. I mean, because that because the SS was so efficient. Um, and the Gestapo was so efficient, uh, it took a while for people to, to in within Germany to resist. But there's some great novels about this and great books about this. I think there's such a, a unity and a power in fighting against such great evil and the, the stuff okay. that they were fighting against that it really united them. And I'll bring up, my mom had another comment. She was saying, it's so okay. sad to think what a mental struggle it must have been for them to assimilate back into society without the solidarity of the other women that were such a part of their, their daily lives. Yeah. You know, uh, when the deportees returned, there were some women um, who were, who formed these groups called the Amica, like uh, little uh, support groups, which are in existence to this day. Um, and originally they formed because they realized that they had to help each other um, find jobs, find clothes, find apartments. Um, they stayed with people who were dying because a lot of the women, as I said, returned with um, uh, deadly diseases and were, would not survive the next few years. And there were stories where the group of the Amical would organize so that they would sit with that woman until she died, so she wouldn't die alone. They promised each other that they wouldn't die alone. These groups organized um, uh, newsletters and they even later organized pilgrimages back to the camps. Some of the women really loved that and were involved in that and needed that. And some of the women really turned away from that because they wanted just to forget and they felt ashamed or they, their, their family wouldn't let them or for whatever reason. So there was, um, but the Amical were really important. And in fact, I am a member of a few of them I, because now of course their role shifted from supporting survivors to becoming uh, archives and bearing witness and they organized trips and um, conferences and, and now it's families of descendants who are members. Um, so it, yes, it, I think it was, it was really hard for many of the women. Um, and I think in the fifties, it's the concentration camp syndrome became recognized as a medical condition, which, um, was, you know, all these conditions that came out of being trauma, basically PTSD, but PTSD from being in a concentration camp. And what wow. also was recognized is a lot of their children were traumatized. They passed that trauma, that unspoken trauma down to the next generation. And I've seen that actually in my research, definitely. The children of the descendants have suffered from some serious mental um, difficulties. And they've talked to me about it as well. And um, even I think there have been, you know, I'm not in the people I interviewed, but some grandchildren. So it, it is, to me, it's really powerful how this unhealed trauma goes, continues <clears throat> through generations and gets passed. You know, and in a lot of ways, you can say that World War One led to World War II. You know, you can really mm -hmm. see how these wars are unending. Yeah, for sure. And these nine women, they went through terrible things, but they are also with all these other people that were going through the same thing. So by writing the story of these women, do you think it helps give power to similar stories that may not have been brought to light yet? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. And I, and I, um, I, I think... Uh, 
the sort of for me, the big part of this, and it's sort of what I was saying when I met um, baby France, uh, 70 year old baby France, um, what I realized was the power of these stories. Um, the, um, the stories really um, make a difference. I didn't understand that in, in, until I did this book. And, um, and it kind of gives, and I've seen now with the families and being in touch with them and their that it, you know, it gives legitimacy to all this sort of experience. And I hope that other people can speak up and talk about what they've uh, experienced, and especially in these kind of traumatic uh, war situations. I mean, there's there's terrible wars and genocides everywhere, unfortunately. So there's a lot of work to be done. But I, I do believe now in a way that I didn't understand before the power of stories and storytelling to heal us. So I, that to me was the biggest um, uh, a comp learning lesson for me from writing this book. Yeah, for sure. Oh, sorry, I got lost it's okay. doing something. It's all right. Um, um, how are these women ultimately able to escape? And uh, do you think they even escape, if not physically, mentally, from all the stuff that they had faced? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they escaped during the death march. They found a moment, in, in, and they knew during the death march that if they didn't escape, they would die. They knew that it was now or never. They basically said, let's escape or die trying. Um, and the death marches were actually very deadly. Um, of all the survivors, if you didn't, if you weren't exterminated upon arrival, and if you had survived until that moment of the camps, uh, over a third of them would die in the next few months during the death marches at the end of the war. So they did save themselves by escaping. Um, I think they also escaped mentally, definitely. And one of the, like, I think I made allusion to it earlier, one of the ways that they did that I love is this story of these recipe books, which seemed so weird to me when I first heard about them and first saw one because Gigi's family showed me a recipe book. Um, and this is where they would steal little pieces of paper and steal a little piece of pencil and they would write down um, on these scraps of paper recipes of how to cook, usually meals that involved a lot of eggs and sugar and flour and butter, all the things that they craved and obviously weren't getting fruit, you know, blah, 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 these really um, yummy desserts and stuff. And they would recite these recipes to each other at night as they were about to go to sleep, you know, step by step. So they would take a long time to, de to describe how they would make you know, their favorite cake or whatever. And um, and these recipes were, the, 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 they would organize uh, eating a meal together, which would be, everyone would, you know, recite a, meal, a course. And they would, um, they had contests for the best cook, which apparently Zinka won once, which was her family said <laughs> so it was a joke because she hated to cook more than anything. <laughs> but um, but these these books, they, they, they kept them with them and they escaped with them and they managed to, to carry them across the, all of these, the refugee camps and everything. And, and then they hardly spoke about them. They were slightly secretive about it because they felt like nobody would understand that they talked about food while they were starving in a concentration camp. But starving people talk about food. It's a way to cope. And it was also a way that they could have a collective memory without it being too painful and a way that they could share memories without it being too painful and a way that they could leave the confines of the camp for a little while. They could be back in their childhood home, enjoying their favorite meal with their family and sharing that with everybody. Uh, it's really, to me, it was kind of interesting because I love to cook and I love to have big meals with my family. And I realized that that's kind of a, you know, sharing a meal is sort of a, an essential human act. Um, mm -hmm. So that was one of the ways they, they were able to escape, you know. Yeah, I think it's a lot of these little things, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, remembering these recipes and stuff that uh, they had mm -hmm. tasted before, these delicious foods, um, finding yeah. ways to, to stay motivated and to help each other and try mm -hmm. to make it as normal of a life as it could. Like mm -hmm. even trying to sew dresses and stuff from the clothes and the rags that they had been given. Yeah. You describe a yeah. lot of that in, in the story in the book that you wrote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, during their escape, they kept talking about it like they were on a camping trip. They, they, may, they tried to make a joke out of it. Like we're just having a long camping trip. I mean, near the end, it starts to t to fray, but they have they keep this illusion up to 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 sort of like have a sense of humor about what they're going through. So, in the beginning of the book, you describe how Helene, or you describe this beautiful scene with uh, Helene, and uh, she's writing these unsolvable math problems on the walls mm -hmm. of one of mm -hmm. her cells, and it's kind of this testament that there's a lot of things in life that we might not know the answer to. So, is there any part of the story where you think we 
may not fully understand? Yeah, um, I, I do feel, well, for me personally, one of the things that was a, 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 a hard is I was not able to find Jose's family. So I, um, that's one of the missing parts of the story. And I hope that my book will bring somebody out of the woodwork that'll say, I was related to Jose and this is what I know about what she went through. Um, and that's definitely, um, I would love that. I would love someone to say like, oh, she was not all how you talk about her, you know, whatever. I, I know I know what the other women said about her and I know that she had a beautiful mm -hmm. singing voice and even her military record mentions her singing voice, but I missed, I wish I knew more about Jose, but that's just a small part of, there's, there is a lot of the stories that is unknown. Um, and I, you know, I thought when I started this that like, oh, this is a story everybody's heard before. But actually, there's so many little details and so many small, um, important, uh, unknown. I, I, I think that we'll be discovering more and more, uh, you know, for a long time. So I, I welcome the mystery, <laughs> you know, the uncovering of these mysteries. Yeah. Yeah. So we're all about histories and mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, even going through this kind of stuff firsthand, it's it's so hard to fully be able to grasp and under understand exactly mm -hmm. what they went through. Yeah. Yeah. But what, but what kind of feedback have you had about your book so far? And uh what do you hope people gain from reading it? And maybe what lessons do you want them to learn from it? Okay. Um I have had some great feedback. I've been really it's been super fun. I I'm uh I was worried, like I said, I was worried about the family when I sent them, all the families when I sent them the book, but they've all been really nice and sending me lovely letters and calls and stuff. And that's just been, I mean, really heartwarming for me. Um, I hope that people gain from reading this book that it's important to take care of each other, uh, that these women uh, took care of each other and that's, and friendship, that their friendship against all odds is what allowed them to survive. And, um, and that, you know, we have to also, be vigilant and maintain our eye and keep a fight against fascism, which is very kind of powerful and creepy the way it can seep into things. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we, that they fought this really valiant fight against one form of fascism, but it's, it's not as if it's, you know, gone away forever. It will, you know, so, um, I, I, I you know, I, I think that's really important. Um, and that, like I said earlier, I really feel like the stories are important to honor the stories and to honor the to the, the, the different things that people went through. And I think that'll help the families and help us all heal from these things. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I humbly <laughs> uh, hope people to get some of these things from what I wrote. Yeah, so we may not have necessarily necessarily the same problems that we had during World War II, but we still have terrible stuff going on in the world and being able to learn from this story that we need to stand up and, and fight against these atrocities, be resilient, mm -hmm. take care of each other. It's right. is such a powerful and important lesson, I think, from your book. So where can people find you? Uh, social media, website? Okay. Yeah, so my website is really simple. It's gwenstrauss.com. And uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm trying to think what my name, I think it's Gwen Strauss Writer on Instagram at Gwen Stuff Writer. And I think um, I'm also, uh, so I have a blog also on my website, which you can get, um, get. And, and the book is available everywhere. Um, and also there's a really great audiobook version with the great actress, Juliet Stevenson. Um, she's just so great. I loved it. I actually listened to her reading That's it awesome. and I thought, oh, I, you know, I, I was so excited. <laughs> So I, I recommend that. But the book, if, if I love to tell people to go to their local bookstore because bookstores are struggling in this time. And so if mm -hmm. you can get the book, um, you can always order it from your local bookstore. But of course, it's also available on all the, every major retailer, Amazon, no, Barnes Noble, any online real estate, it's, it's there. So um, yeah, I, you know, welcome anyone <laughs> to order and read it. It's also available on Kindle and all those different platforms, yeah. Yeah, definitely go buy the book. I'm halfway through my copy right now and I'm enjoying it. I love the story so far, but I definitely go check out the book, The Nine. And uh, Gwen, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, really. Thank you for inviting me and talking with me. Yeah, it was really good talking and with thank you. And nice. I love the comments from your mom. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay.